Okay, so here we've got our overall modeling process with the different steps. Um, our covariates and predictors, again, these could be the same or they could be separate. Our field data or sample data comes typically from the field set of points, uh, which we've had our covariates to match our response. Um, and then what we're going to start doing is we're going to be doing a split between test and training data. And I'll talk a bit about that. Then we build our model. Um, we get the model, then we can take and bring our predictors in, do a prediction, that gives us our predicted values. We're going to validate that against our test data, check it against our test data to see um, is the model not only predicting the data we trained it on, but is also predicting uh, test data. Now, this is what's typically done today because we, we split up our data set, but of course we'd rather have our test data come from a new external data set that wasn't part of initial sample data. It's rare that we get to do that, uh, but that's the best case. So this is the best we can do unless we have that other data set. We validate that, that produces some statistics, but then we can also produce a predictive map, summarize that, and do uncertainty maps. Now, we can repeat this over and over again, and I'm gonna give you some new terminology for this. So up here, when we try different combinations of covariates, a jackknife is where we try all possible combinations. We'll talk more about that. Cross-validation is where we split it into two. Um, noise injection is where we inject noise either with the predictors or with the sample data to see what the result is. And then we can also inject noise into the parameters. In other words, um, this would be the gamma parameter, the parameters you're using to create the model. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then we can repeat this over and over again, and that's called Monte Carlo. It is not Monte Carlo Markov chain because there is no state machine here, but you will see that misquoted periodically. Uh, it's just Monte Carlo from the gambling where you go out and play roulette and you do it over and over again and you hope to make money. Um, okay, so cross-validation, definitely the most commonly used, most important of these. You've really got to have this in any paper uh, to get it published, any modeling paper. And again, the idea is to take the data and split it into training and test data sets. We then build the model with the training data set, test it or validate it with the test data set. Okay. And there's two general categories um, of how to do this. Basically, the first one, leave P out cross-validation. Now, these terms aren't used heavily anymore, so I'm not going to test anything. Um, but the idea there is that you validate on some number of samples and train it on the remainder. And then you repeat that for all combinations of the samples. So we'll talk more about the methods, specific methods for that. So non-exhaustive is you do the same thing, but you only do it on a subset of um, combinations. And that's by far the most common with splitting 30% test and 30% training. <clears throat> okay, a common method used to be more common, you don't see this as much anymore, is K-fold cross-validation. And this is where we break the data into K sections, uh, typically 10. And then we test on one of them and train on the remainder. So in other words, if you've got 100 points, you'd break them up into 10 buckets, randomly put them in 10 buckets, and then you would go ahead and train on 2 through 10 and test on 1. Then you go ahead and train on 1, 3 through 10, and test on 2. Train on 1 and 2, 4 through 10, and then test on three, et cetera, until you've covered all of it. So it's exhaustive, good method, um, not used as much anymore as the 30-70 cross-validation split. The number of points that you use is basically the issue, the number of points you use for the test. So this would be 10% test. Um, boot strapping is where you draw um, some number of samples from the data with replacement. In other words, if you have 100 points, you pull out 10 for test and you'd leave the 100. You'd, you'd build the model with all of them and then you run this over and over again drawing these random samples. Now the reason you would use this method instead of um, breaking it up into separate boxes between test and training is if you have a very small data set. If you only have 10 points, uh, you can't break them up into 10 different sets, right? It'd be one point per set. And if you do it randomly, some of them would be empty. So that doesn't work. Um, so in bootstrapping, you can have 10 points and you draw three, build the model, test against three. Now the problem is those three data points were used to build the model, so it's not as rigorous as the other methods. But again, used when you have small data sets. Random Forest draws samples from the data with replacement again and then it does this many times, and this is used with tree methods. 
It then looks at the splits or the branches that are selected and the most common and then assembles those together into a large, um, somewhat complex tree. This is also uh, called bootstrap aggregation or bagging. Uh, not as popular as it was a few years ago, but still there. Um, then there's something called boosting, which is kind of on the theoretical learning side, asking this question of can weak learners create a single stronger learner? Or really, can we use a bunch of simple trees to create a really complex tree? Uh, now you can already guess that I don't really like these methods because they tend to overfit. At the extreme end of that is boosted regression trees, which combine thousands of trees to reduce deviance from the data. Uh, currently very popular um, <laughs> because they give you perfect performance statistics. You can literally create trees that match every single sample point. And I've seen that done um, when folks just lose the idea that, that we need to also have the simplest model that matches the phenomenon. Okay, so different types of testing. Sensitivity testing is we inject small amounts of noise in model parameters. So in other words, this would be if you ran a GAM and you wanted to see, well, how stable is my GAM? Especially if you have a lot of covariates. Um, if you change the gamma parameter a little bit, we've seen the covariate response curves flip and they go upside down from where they were, which is not a good thing, right? It's not really a stable model. Now, usually those are covariates that aren't contributing a lot, but if I saw that, I would definitely remove those covariates because I'm now going to have a more stable or robust model. Now, the reason to inject noise is because there's always noise in our data. Uh, it's just inherent in the systems that we have. It's inherent in the universe, quite actually. So if you, in other words, if you went out and you measured the diameter breast height of a bunch of trees and you went out with exactly the same measuring equipment and you measured them again, you would get slightly different answers. There's always noise in our data, both in the response and the covariate data. So um, the idea here with sensitivity testing and the other noise injection I'll talk about is that we can model that noise, especially if we know anything about it, we can just inject a little bit of noise into the parameters in this case and see what happens. Well, again, we can use that same approach with our response variables and our covariates. Um, more on that in a sec. So jackknifing, uh, simple, robust, kind of cool method. If you're really struggling with your covariates um, and you don't have too many, this is a good approach. This is built into Maxent and we'll see it there. Um, but it's trying every single combination of covariates. In other words, setting up all possible combinations of covariates. So if we have three, here's the seven possible combinations. Obviously, if you have 10 covariates, you're going to have a lot of combinations. And then you create models for every single combination of covariates. And then pick the best one based on your performance statistics and what matches the phenomenon. Okay, so again, uh, robust, good thing to do, but usually not needed. Um, okay, so summarizing. Here's where we might inject noise. We'll talk more about that into our sample data into our covariates. Also sensitivity testing is randomizing the model parameters. Okay, jackknifing up here. And this is the scenario where we have our field data and our covariates that are put together in the same sample data. So uh, this would either be where you've gone out and measured a bunch of points and you've taken covariate data, usually temperature data, other data, soil moisture, things like that in the field with your points and you're just modeling your points or where you're doing something like we did with presence absence over the entire state of California with a grid. So you've got your, your covariates that you're gonna predict from in the same data set as your field data. Now, more commonly, we're gonna have those as two separate data sets. Our covariates and our predictors are gonna be separate. Um, we're gonna have our field data. We're gonna extract our covariates at the points where our field data are. That becomes our sample data and then we use the full raster grids to be able to do our prediction. Same methods for model evaluation. All of this is called model evaluation together. Um, and what we can do is we can use Monte Carlo methods, which is basically repeating this over and over again. It comes from Monte Carlo, the gambling casino in Southern France, gambling town. Um, and we repeat it over and over again. And by repeating over and over again, we can get a really good idea of what's happening with our model as things change a little bit, as there's noise, as there's different splits to our data, and really build robustness into our models and also create uncertainty maps. Okay, 
So um, further summarizing um, what we've gone through so far, uh, remember that response drives the method. So in other words, if we have binary data, we're probably going to use a GLM. If you have linear data, linear regression. Categorical, probably CART. Um, if it's logarithmic or exponential, well, you might straighten it, right? If you have non-uniform residuals in your covariates, we would probably use a GLM, a generalized linear model. Sorry, the general linear model, not the generalized linear model. That's why I put general there. Okay, so that was where we transform the covariates to linear and then go ahead and fit it. Um, if they're homoscedastic, you go ahead and use GAMS because you can't transform the covariates. And pretty much any other continuous variables that you have, I would throw them into GAMS and see what GAMS do. And if the GAMS end up looking very linear or logistic, you might go to a simpler method. It doesn't happen too often. Okay, to review the different methods we've looked at, um, these are all the ones we've looked at so far, and we're going to be looking at Maxent and Hemi2 here in the near future. Um, as I mentioned before, usually it's the response variable that drives the method, linear being continuous, but also expect a linear relationship. Um, continuous or binomial for GLMs, usually binomials used. GAMS would be continuous. Um, CART, categorical or continuous, but usually I would recommend using it for categorical. And then Maxent and Hemi are special because they use presence only. So this is used with occurrence data, and we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. Um, now also just as important is the method that's being used because we want to make sure that the, the equation within or the, the way that things are being modeled matches what we would expect from the natural phenomenon that we're modeling. So linear for linear regression. If your phenomenon isn't linear, we shouldn't be using linear regression. Might use it if you have a narrow data range that fits over that, but it's really common for people then try and extend those results beyond that range. Uh, logistic for lots of different things, especially um, growth models. GLM works well. Um, GAMS, the most general for continuous by far. Uh, trees, again, the nature of it, especially if it's categorical, is where I would use trees. Um, and then Maxent and Hemi both use different types of curves, but Hemi is really constrained to use smooth Bezier curves and not very many. Uh, Maxent uses a number of different combinations, and so it's much more likely to overfit. But I will show you how to control the overfitting with Maxent. Um, we have a parameter we can do that with. Um, so it's the most likely to overfit, but that's just with the defaults. Uh, you can't really overfit with Hemi2 or even GAMS. It's pretty unlikely. GLM and Linear, of course, they're, they're too simple to overfit. So you're safe on overfitting with those. Um, and that, of course, maps to the complexity of it. All right. Uh, handy chart for you to reference when you like. Um, and again, overview. So really the whole modeling approach is the way we model. It's not just picking the modeling approach. It's picking the right set of predictors or covariates. It's estimating the coefficients and then evaluating the coefficients. Uh, we validate, extremely important. Would love to do it against a new, sub, new set of data, but often we have to do it against a subset. And then testing things like parameter sensitivity and uncertainty estimation um, to make sure we have a really robust model. And this is the whole process to really have robust models that you can defend um, not only because they do a good job at modeling the phenomenon, but you can also show how good they are. In other words, you can say, yeah, this, this doesn't work well in these situations, or here's the amount of uncertainty within it. <clears throat> we need to go collect more field data, which happens a lot. Or we need a new uh, predictor variable, which happens almost as often. Have fun.